Well, why don't we get started? Um, welcome, everybody. We'll probably have some more people floating in in a minute. Um, but today we have a special speaker, as usual, um, special in her own way. Uh, Carolyn Miller is um, a plant recorder for MSU and also operates Two Green Thumbs Gardening. I um, hope to hear more about that. She has a rich history of um, botany, and maybe she'll uh, she'll uh, talk a little bit about that. I did discover one interesting thing, which maybe she'll talk um, about as well, but she planted 60,000 trees in Hawaii, <laughs> working for uh, Charles Schultz's ex-wife, the creator of Peanuts. So I want to hear more about that. But without further ado, welcome, Carolyn. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I am happy to be here on a cold day, but at least the sun looks like it's trying to shine. And what better way to get us kind of through this cold weather, but uh, native plants and native, you know, the flowers and everything. So, you know, quick background about me. I, I did my degree, my undergrad degree at MSU in botany and plant pathology. I'm currently one more class to go for my master's in biology from Miami University. I'm also the president of the Wildflower Association of Michigan. I'm heavily involved in the Michigan Botanical Society. Um, plants have always been my thing since I was probably three years old. So my heart is, my heart and passion is with uh, Michigan native plants and getting those, getting that plant material into the landscape, especially urban spaces since we're all going to, you know, the majority of the population in the next 20, 30 years will be living in cities. So we need to, we need to help our pollinators. And that's sort of been my drive in the last 13 plus years, so to speak. So we're going to talk about Michigan native plants and what works really well in our urban spaces. All right, let's see if it wants to move. Oh, come on. You may have given it a minute. It's uh, it's thinking. <laughs> okay, so why native plants? Low input landscapes. We don't need to add fertilizer or herbicides or any of that to these. They conserve water once they are established. I leave them alone. Um, this last year, of course, we had the drought and I put some new ones in. So those I did give a little bit of water here and there, but for the rest of the plants that I had in my yard, didn't do a thing to them. They reduce global climate change by sequestering carbon by their extensive root systems, preserve biodiversity, support pollinators and songbirds. And, you know, a big one for me was to connect to nature. Um, that's what I love. And all I would come home after work. I literally would put a chair <laughs> in my front yard and watch all the pollinators coming on in. And it was just amazing to see that increase year after year. And the best part, I didn't have any grass to mow. I have a very small yard, urban yard. I didn't want to buy a lawnmower, uh, so I, this is what this was my passion. And you don't have to do as extensive as I did, but for me, it made sense to not have a lawnmower pushing out all that, you know, all those exhaust fumes and the noise. Um, so I'm good to go. So when you're thinking about your yard, you, there are considerations with urban yards. And three of those big things are plant height, seasonal dieback, and maintenance. Um, plant height, very important because you don't want to impede, uh, um, you know, carve the, um, you know, cars and you want to be able to see around things. So, you know, if you're close to the sidewalk, put things shorter in the sidewalk. But if you're going to put it further back in your yard, then probably... The sky's a seasonal dieback, you, you know, 
we want to have a lot, you know, we want to have a succession of plant material blooming for those pollinators and butterflies and everything that comes to visit from spring until that first frost. Maintenance, there's kind of this misnomer that everybody says, well, you put native plants in, you don't have to do anything else. That's not the case. There is maintenance involved. It's just, for me, it's not that much. I do a lot of, you know, things seed, maybe I don't want them all there. So I have to do a little thinning out here and there. I also, some of the plants that I have tend to seed quite a bit. So once they're done flowering, I just, I nip their heads off so that they're not spreading all over the place. And lastly, what habitat are you trying to mimic? That is actually pretty important to what you, what plants are gonna work well in your yard. So I always tell people, do some research. Um, these are some really great sources, Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, they've also produced a guide, a field guide to the natural communities of Michigan. You can look up your county and get an idea of what plant material should hopefully be there. Wild Type Nursery in Mason, the website has a great planting guide that um, you know, separates plants out by sun, you know, the light levels and also soil type. Prairie Moon Nursery and also Prairie Nursery. They're kind of, they're also in the Midwest. So we also need to look at your light levels and what the soil type is. So what to consider? Root structure. So the three, the three typical root structures are tap roots, fibrous roots, and rhizomatous roots. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about all these a little bit later. Soil. Is it clay? Is it sand? Is it loam? For the most of us here in Lansing and the Ingham County area, probably a lot of clay. Um, I know clay is very prevalent. I'm originally from Grand Rapids. There's a lot of clay over there. So you might need a little bit, you know, so that's where you kind of have to look at what clay tends to hold water, but it also tends to dry out and become solid as a rock. So you may need to augment the soil a little bit just to help those plants. But again, those, those root systems of those native plants, will they'll go down. They will break down that soil and allow for water percolation. And as the roots die, adds more organic matter as well. The sun, is it full sun, part sun, part shade, full shade? Soil moisture, dry, medium, moist. And that really, that kind of spins off on what the soil type can be as well. And size, very important. <laughs> so here's just an idea. These are native plants. So this is how far down some of those native roots go. In the far left, you can see our lovely Kentucky bluegrass with maybe about an inch to two inches of root material, that's it. Look at all the other plant material. Those are all native plants of Michigan. And look how far down those tap, those all of those roots go, be it fibrous or tap root. They are incredible. This is what percolates water on in your, in your yard, keeps that water on site. It is not running down streets, into the sewer and dumping into a river, such as the Red Cedar River. This is why we want plant, this is why we really need the native plants in our yards. And all those roots sequester carbon, which is so important nowadays. So let's talk about the root systems. Tap roots. So primarily single root that goes down, slightly branches off. Butterfly weed is one of those. Um, compass plant. I love the silphium species. They, um, these two have great uh, taproot systems. Compass plant can get pretty big, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about placement later. But these, for a small urban air, for a small yard or an urban yard, taproot system plants are some of the better ones to use. Also, the fibrous root systems. So these root systems just, they go down and they spread all over, they just spread out. 
And again, increasing all those little fractures in the soil to allow water to percolate down. Um, so if you're thinking fibrous and tap roots are probably some, those two are my go-to plants when I am planting um, for clients. The rhizominous root systems, those are the runners. So they horizontally run. Canada anemone, you know, I really, I like this plant, but it can get a little troublesome in small areas. So unless you have a huge area that you plan to put it in, then so be it, it will be fine. But small areas, you need to be very careful of it. Common milkweed, I enjoy it so much. However, it runs. So in urban, when I do urban landscapes, common milkweed is one that I will not put in because it tends to run. Canada goldenrod, perfect for a field all by itself, but probably rarely sold in uh, native plant nurseries because it is extremely aggressive. But there are rhizominous plants that do play well with others. So pussy toes, Antonaria neglecta, it only gets about two inches tall and it slowly creeps. Prairie smoke, absolutely love this plant in the, er in the early spring, um, that slowly creeps as well. Maidenhair fern is a great um, kind of a ground cover. So again, slowly spreads, but great ground cover for shady areas. So these guys do play well with others. Soil moisture. So it's the right plant for the right place. And this is where I say that research is key. Lupin, for example, it prefers it dry and sandier. You're not gonna put lupin in a damp area. It will, it will rot out every time. I have tried this poor plant, which I absolutely love in my urban yard, but I think my soil is a little too rich and it just, it doesn't do well at all. Cardinal flower, don't put it in a dry area. It prefers it damp. If you wanna create a rain garden, cardinal flower is one of those fantastic plants to put in. Plant height is very important to consider. Um, learn where to place them. And we'll talk, a we'll talk a lot more about this. The plant on the right is um, rosin weed. I loved it. The bees absolutely felt, you know, they are, they were always all over it. Lots of seed for, um, especially goldfinches were just constantly visit, visiting this. However, it seeds like crazy. So this one has been removed from my yard because of that. Otherwise it would literally take over. So let's look at uh, light requirements. So shady areas. What gives a shade? Is it tree? Is it another house? I always tell people to take a day and watch the area. You know, do you get morning sun? Do you get afternoon sun? Afternoon sun tends to be a lot hotter. So take that into consideration. Morning sun, not as warm, but you know, it will be shaded typically later in the day. So that's why Taking that time to actually watch an area where the sun is, is it's, it really is important. So shaded area. So the tree here is giving shade to this small area. And there's one fantastic thing about some shaded areas. You can plant with spring ephemerals and those shade loving natives, which can be a lot of fun. So the spring ephemerals are very important to early emerging bees, especially the queen bumblebees, because they're some of the first to emerge and they are on, they're on a kick to find floral resources so that she can begin making, you know, getting her brood started for that season. So those early ephemerals are so important to those emerging queen bumblebees. 
And we're going to talk about some of those plants that are so important. Midsummer, mid to late summer, goldenrods are so important for beneficial pollinators. The bees, butterflies, beetles, um, other seraphid flies, they rely on those mid to late summer blooms to come out for, you know, to find those floral resources. So some of these spring ephemerals for, for a shady setting, and I'm just gonna let you know, this is a handful of them. There are so many more. Um, spring is probably my favorite time of year because all these spring ephemerals are emerging and it's just a joy to know that spring is on the way, followed by summer and all our native plants. So Spring Beauty um, is actually, there is a specialist bee and it's tiny and it only feeds on Spring Beauty. That is it. Here on campus in the Sanford natural area. So there's a lot of Spring Beauty all around. And on a sunny day, when those have begun to emerge, these little bees are all over that spring beauty. Virginia bluebells, Dutchman's britches, white trillium, those are some of the big ones that the queen bumblebees will find. And it's really fun to watch if you get that opportunity to see either bumblebee on Dutchman's britches or squirrel corn, both of those are dicentras. Those plants are buzz pollinated. So that queen bumblebee literally hangs from the bottom. She vibrates her body, which releases the pollen and she gathers it. And I can't say how many times I've walked past some of our patches of both of those, um, both of those dicentra species and I can hear that buzz and I can look down. There she is, she's vibrating her body to get that, to get, you know, to get them to release the pollen. Uh, wood poppy, another fantastic, slightly a little bit, it's still, still spring ephemeral, but just a little bit later, which is good for all the, you know, the other emergent bees that are coming out. Then we kind of transition, with, you know, still spring ephemerals, woodland flocks, columbine, which also the hummingbirds will visit. Um, oops, forgot to name a couple of these other ones, but there's hepatica, which is the one in the upper right corner, and then down below, dog tooth violet. Um, again, all of these and false Solomon seal, all visited by, you know, all those native bees that are finally starting to emerge. Here's kind of those late summer bloomers. Um, red baneberry starts to come out, um, and then, you know, and again, food source. Uh, I love zigzag goldenrod and blue stem goldenrod for those later goldenrod species that, you know, they're not aggressive um, in nature and, you know, they're not very tall either. So they stay on the short side, but again, these, you know, they're perfect for all of our native pollinators because they're, you know, they're starting to come out. And it's a food source, more floral food source for our native bees. Maidenhair fern makes an excellent ground cover in shady areas. Um, probably one of my favorite ferns. It's just so dainty. I absolutely love it. So the what plants worked in my area um, and why did I start? So why I started, I really didn't want to mow a lawn. And I also knew that pollinators on a whole are declining. And I wanted to do my part. I wanted to create an oasis for our pollinators so that there's a food source. Bumblebees can fly up to a mile to even more to attain floral resources. Most of our native pollinators, which honeybees are not native to the United States, but most of our Native pollinators are small. The bees are fairly small and they really don't fly very far. So offering them a, you know, resources for food and shelter was important to me. So how did I start? 
I got rid of all the turf. Um, I think the first summer we moved in, <laughs> I was done with it. Uh, what changed? What has changed? Some of those plants were a little too aggressive. Um, ironweed, love the plant, but it just, it would seed like crazy. So I sort of got tired of that one. And the good news is, is I had other clients who had spaces and I could just dig them up and move them out. Uh, what did I learn? That was a big one. Some things don't always play well with others. So they got moved to somewhere else. And now we'll talk about what plants worked. So my entire yard is pretty much full on sun. Um, that's a redbud tree that has gotten actually much larger than that. And so now it gives me a little bit of shade so I can actually plant some shady loving uh, native plants under that tree, which I am actually ecstatic about. So those spring native plants, it worked. Um, prairie smoke, absolutely. I just, you know, this is another buzz pollinated plant that I could go out and sit and watch those queen bubble bees grab onto the bottom of that flower, buzz, and they will release the pollen. Prairie phlox, you know, what can I say about this gorgeous pink flower? Um, I would get some of the butterflies coming in. The, um, uh, what is it, what is it, what is it? The bubble, the hummingbird moth would come in, um, pasque flower. Look at all that pollen. And they would be all over that, including the bumblebees, but also the other ones. Also other bees, once the weather once those temperatures warmed up and they were able to emerge. Slightly behind that, I then have my hairy beard tongue and sand coreopsis. Um, both are, I'll tell you what, the sand coreopsis just blooms for, oh my gosh, uh, almost a month. And it is a pollinator magnet for all the bees. Um, no matter what size, they're always all over it. Same with hairy beard tongue. Usually the smaller ones, we're getting into those because it's kind of tubular. So the smaller bees could get into that. The regular penstemon, slightly larger bees could get down in there. Um, usually about this time, I would start to see some honeybees begin to show up. So those, you know, somewhere there's some hives and they found my yard. <laughs> Yellow cone flowers, uh, love this one, as do the goldfinches once those seeds ripen. Swamp milkweed, this is one of the other milkweeds I will put in. I did create a small rain garden. So swamp milkweed is in that rain garden and is always covered by these incredible wasps, solitary wasps, so she's doing her thing. Purple cone flower, visited by so many of the uh, the sweat bees would come to this one, as well as um, the bumblebees and occasionally some of the, when I would catch them, the honeybees. So these are all medium sized plants for kind of the middle of the yard. Rough blazing star, I love the blazing stars. Um, they tend to bloom a little bit later in the summer and all of these would just be covered in bees, native bees, also the honeybees, but it was just thrilling to watch all of those native bees come in and the butterflies, the swallowtail butterflies, the monarchs would feed. And one of the goldenrods that I do enjoy is Riddle's goldenrod. Um, doesn't get super large, doesn't spread super fast. Um, and I do like this one and so do all the migrating monarchs and the other butterflies and the other bees as well. So these two, prairie dock and compass plant can get pretty large. So why would I have these in my yard? <laughs> so I have these closest to the house um, because they do get tall. The prairie dock, it's the leaves those leaves would be over two feet long and over two feet wide. And if you have a deer problem, that is one of your plants to put in. The leaves are very rough. 
and deer don't like that on their tongues. So they will, of course, they're always going to nibble, but they're not going to nibble much because of that roughness of the leaf. Same, and it puts up a, the prairie dot puts up a stalk. Oh, I think this year mine probably got up about nine feet and then all the flowers are at the top. Um, the goldfinches absolutely love it, uh, as well as all the bees. The compass plant, supposedly it, you know, a lot of sunflowers tend to move uh, in regards to the sun and compass plant, it's the leaves that kind of turn to orient themselves in the sun, or if they get too much, they can orient themselves away from the sun. Again, perfect plant if you have a deer problem because the leaves are rough. This one has kind of short leaves all the way up the stalk. Um, I think mine got about, mine tend to get about six feet tall and flowers up and down the stalk. Um, all the bees absolutely love that plant as well, as my, and so do I. So these are kind of my two focal plants in the yard. Some of the other ones that I have put in, uh, prairie clover, or excuse me, the purple clover. This is a really good one for those smaller native pollinators. And if you look in that up left corner, you can see a very tiny, uh, native bee hanging out. So again, the thing is, is to offer, you know, flowers spring through, spring through fall, but also different shapes and sizes because one size doesn't fit all. So that's what we have to remember. Bottle gentian, it is only pollinated by bumblebees because they're the only ones strong enough to pry those petals open and get down in there to get the floral resource. And it is a riot to watch them do that. Bee balm, Monarda fistulosa, hands down, probably one of the, one of the best mints um, for pollinators. This is a skipper of some species and everybody is always all over it. Another bee balm I like is Bradbury bee balm. It is a little bit shorter and blooms a little bit earlier. So I have incorporated that into my landscape just so there's kind of those, you know, overlapping bloom times between the two of them. And this last summer, there was a significant delay in many of the flowers due to that drought. But the Bradbury Bee Balm, that one came out, gave some more floral, so, you know, gave those floral resources to everything. And then finally, the Monarda fistulosa was able to come forth as well. So um, ground covers, I tend to use Pennsylvania sedge as a ground cover. Um, I also use pussy toes, which is Antonaria neglecta. So you can see how tall it is. It's not very tall. This one does has done so well in a lot. So I have my entire front yard. It has a brick border. Then the soil's up to the top of the bricks behind it. And the pussy toes is in one is in one of the corners that will just bake in the afternoon. And pussy toes can take a lot of neglect. Um, probably if you look at the, you know, the species name, neglecta. So it does very well. And what's so what's really fun about this plant is that there's uh, Carter bees, Carter wood bees, and they will actually, so the, the leaves are really fuzzy and those bees will actually scrape the fuzz off of the leaves. And that's what they use to line their nest with. So on any given day, there's all these, all these bees are all over this, just scraping the fuzz off because they tend to bloom early in the springtime. So that part's done, but there's a source for nesting material. Nodding onion, um, I, I really love, you're gonna hear me say, I love this plant. I do, I love just about every single one of them. And nodding onion is kind of a late summer bloomer that finally comes out and you can see there's a bumblebee just going to town, gathering 
you know, getting nectar and getting the pollen to provision the nests with, but um, an excellent source. The a lot of the solitary wasps love it. The smaller wasps love it, and just a fabulous plant to also have in the yard. And a short grower at that. So the middle section is kind of you know. Oh, I'd say that's probably late summer. So the butterfly weed is going, the Antonieri is full, all those short guys are, you know, in the front. I get taller towards the back. Um, there's Culver's root. So I have Culver's root that's in there. Again, small flowers for those small pollinators. Um, you know, and a lot of this has just been experimenting of what works and what doesn't. The rosin weed is up in that kind of upper left-hand corner. Most of the rosin weed is now gone <laughs> because it just seeded far too much. And it was just, you know, it was all over. So I finally decided you need to come out and we can go and it can go somewhere else in somebody else's yard that has plenty of space. Um, some of the other ones I put in, Recently, I have put in, um, oh my goodness, I can see it. Um, oh, golly geez, Royal Catchfly. So incredible, beautiful red flowers. The hummingbirds visit it over and over and over. I have put some of those in and they call it Catchfly because the stems are actually sticky. And so insects land on those and well, they're stuck. And let's see, two summers ago, I was, um, one of my grad courses was in Northern Illinois and we went to some prairies and we're walking along and I, I had never seen this plant in the wild. And I looked into the prairie and I saw red flowers. And I literally almost dropped everything. And I went bounding through the prairie and my classmates knew that I was a plant nerd. And of course they all wanted to know, well, what is it? Well, what is it? And I just yelled out, it's Royal Catchfly. And oh my gosh, what a stunning plant. So I was able to get some plants from, I believe I got mine through either Prairie Moon Nursery or prairie nursery and they've done so well in the yard it's just an added you know piece of red for the hummingbirds to come in <clears throat> excuse me and also you know cardinal flowers same thing <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um another ground cover i use is ivory sedge uh this is right up against hangs along the brick the brick pathway that I have, you know, the brick border I put in. So just to put some other sedges in, and I like to put the sedges in sporadically. I also use prairie drop seed grass as another ground cover. Um, when I do a lot of urban landscapes, prairie drop seed is one of my go-to grasses to put in. It does not get very tall, stays, you know, you can tell the blades probably maybe a foot tall, maybe a little bit more than that, but not much. The seed heads tend to get a little bit taller than that, but as they wave in the wind or you brush up against them, they release the most incredible scent. And it's hard to describe, but I would say it smells sort of licorice-y in a sense. Um, again, it's just one of my favorite grasses to use in urban settings because, you know, it is such a wonderful grass. It clumps, you know, doesn't spread, just little clumps. And it's a, it's a perfect, you know, I'd be happy just having a matrix of prairie drop seed and then just plucking in threes and fives of different plant material um, here and there. But if you need a if you need a grass and it has an extensive fibrous root system, it's awesome. 
And that's one of my favorites. Um, Wild Petunia, Ruelia humilis. I have put that in kind of along some of the edges. Beautiful blue flowers. Um, it does so well in the heat. And I just absolutely love that one as well. So why did I landscape with Nate? You know, why did I landscape with We lost your audio there, Carolyn. Yep. Oh. Is it okay? I think we got you back. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, um, we may want to um, reserve a little time for Q&A towards the end, just to a reminder there. That sounds fine. Almost done. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, so that's why I did it. And I didn't want to mow along. So... These are the helpful resources that I mentioned, uh, literature and also nurseries. So um, any of these are so helpful. They've got great, um, excellent inventory of plants. I would you know, encourage you to check them out. I'll leave it there if you wanna take a snapshot. <laughs> and excellent literature. And thank you so much. I really appreciated this. And that is a bristlecone pine. Some of those pines are, there's a few that are over a thousand years old. And this one right here could easily be 300 years old. It's, you know, the conditions are not conducive for growth. So they grow very, very slowly, but that's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> and is there any questions? Thank you so much. What a rich uh, fountain of information you are. Um, oh, I enjoy it. <laughs> feel free to unmute yourselves if you've got some questions. I know I've got a couple, but I'll let other people go first. So do a lot of these, say I wanted to have like kind of a full sun lawn set up um, in Kent County, where you're from. Where I commute from every day. Is it run the kind of about the same plants? Yes. That you'd use yes. I have my parents' home is still in Grand Rapids, and a lot of those plants that I have in my yard are in that yard as well. Okay. Yeah. And look into your conservation districts because a lot of them have plant sales. And I know that Kent Conservation District has a native plant sale where they mm -hmm. have a number of growers that come over. So that's a you know, it's an excellent an excellent opportunity to get native plants and native shrubs and trees, which we really didn't talk about, but that's another, that's another lecture. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Barb, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I was wondering, is, is the rosin weed uh, a Rudbeckia? No, it, well, it is in the, it's in the aster family, mm -hmm. but it's a sylphium species. So we've got four sylphium species, rosin weed, prairie, prairie dock, compass plant, and cup plant are all sylphium species. I loved your presentation. There was so much good information there. Um, you know, when you talk about with that uh, rosin weed plant, how the problem is so many seeds and it spreads. And that's, of course, there are there are horticultural varieties, you know, with uh, where uh, some of the flowering structures, the anthers or the pistil, mm -hmm. have been converted to petals, and so you don't get seeds. Of course, they're horticultural varieties and not native plants. But it seems like maybe there's uh, there should be a balance between what's right for people's yards. Yes. So I will tell people. If you want to use one of those horticultural varieties, um, echinacea, um, coneflower, there are, I don't even want to know how many native ours, we call them native ours, um, there are. I will tell people, if you are really thinking about those, I always say, keep the same flower color, the same leaf color, 
Do not do double blossoms because they're absolutely, there's no floral resources whatsoever. You know, that's been sort of bred out of it. Um, so those are the things like, you know, I've got a few native R's in, you know, uh, one of my echinacea purpurea is powwow berry and stays a little shorter, not as tall and lanky. Um, I do like it. The bees do come to it. Um, New England Aster, there's one called uh, Purple Dome. He stays short, uh, you know, short and very fluffy with flowers. The bees come to that. It's a lot of the asters, you can actually cut back about even the mints. So maybe late June, between mid-June, late June, I'll cut back, I'll half my New England aster and it puts out more blossoms and stays much shorter. So, you know, tricks of the trade. <laughs> so mo how do you define a native var and are most of them then dwarf varieties? It just depends. It really depends. Some are dwarf, a lot are different colors um, or a variegated leaf. Um, I'm pretty sure you could probably find a lot of those in your box stores, also at Van Atta's. I know that they've got a pretty extensive selection of those native R's. Um, oh, what's the one over by Ann Arbor area? Um, Gee Farms, they've got, a, they have a lot of those native R's as well. Question. Um, Sure. Go ahead, Just, Roberta. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I, I'm i blind and I can't see the pictures are showing. I'm curious what the layout, physical layout was. Did you have like beds that were separated by walkways or what? Could you tell me a little bit about your layout? Sure. So, any, so up close to the sidewalk, so I did a brick border all the way around the front yard using pavers. Behind pretty much all three sides, so the west side, the south side, which is where the sidewalk is, and then the east side, which goes up the driveway, all along I'd say around two feet in, I had short plants, so those short, loving heat plants that did they could do very well because you know they're baking um uh -huh. because there's just, there's no trees and then behind those i would put those medium sized plants in closer to the house sky was a limit so that's where i have the prairie dock the compass plant um i have panicum grass there's some big blue stem grass uh, what else did I put in? Some of the taller asters, the late, later blooming asters, they're all close to the house. So I really wanted to keep short guys in the front for, you know, so that you had visibility. So how, how large, I mean, so when you have to do maintenance or any kind of weeding to help establish, get the plants established, do you just walk in amongst I mean, is it like a 20 by 50 feet and just walk in amongst everything or? Pretty or much. So I, okay. you know, I initially put in some pavers uh, for me to step on, um, just like flagstone. Um, mm -hmm. They're sort of all consumed by all the plants now, but, um, you know, it still works. I just, you know, I literally tiptoe through the tulips. <laughs> so, okay. But, you know, and they're, you know, native plants are pretty hardy, um, but I do, you know, I'm mindful of where I step. So I just sort of, you know, I get in there in the spring, once the temperatures are warm enough and I know that those native bees have emerged, then I clean it up and just get ready for things to start, you know, popping up and cleaning up anything I need to clean up and wait. I've got a couple uh, native bee hotels, so I clean those out and get those ready for the upcoming season. And um, you mentioned working with clients. Do you 
Are you available for hire? Oh yeah. <laughs> this okay. is this is the this has been the focus of my master's degree is getting people in urban areas to just replace a little bit of their turf grass. I went all out because again, I you know I have a small yard, but you know a four by four area is all you need to get you know with some things that are blooming consistently throughout the growing season that will help the pollinators. And for me, it's always been it's been remarkable to watch every you know every summer you know I would have a new butterfly species and. My wife would just laugh because I'd come bolting in the door, get my camera, and <laughs> bolt back outside to get pictures of them. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. That's a um, wonderful presentation. You're very welcome. Barb, did you have another question? Yes, thank uh, you. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Carolyn, I think your uh, description of landscaping that pays attention to height when you're using native plants is something that would be really good for um okay go ahead right, Barb. for you to pay attention to especially with those um those circles that have been planted in meridian township there's one that's um park lake and bircham i think yeah it's i mean i think it's great to put in the native plants but it's very ugly yes yeah. I think, you know, if know. there was attention paid to the height, like you yes. described, um, it could make it a more attractive feature. I would agree. Um, you know, I'm in Lansing. We go that way to go to Costco. <laughs> and I always, I cringe every time I drive around. Because <laughs> it could, and again, you know, in a municipality, it's not a, you know, it's not a one and done. You don't plant it and leave it have to get involved, you know, a group of folks can get involved to try to, you know, keep that, you know, keep it clean. Um, and, it, you know, and probably they just didn't look at the right planting scheme of what to go in. Um, I know it's hard. It's the same thing along Pennsylvania Avenue in Lansing. A lot of weeds have come in and I don't think anybody's doing anything and I cringe at that one too <laughs> like yeah. what was what was your plan left, <laughs> left to put together a team to um, address that roundabout exactly <laughs> so I'm going to sign you both up <laughs> I, I would love to because you know it really is um near and dear to my to um you know get involved and and it's you know it's important. So I just put my email in the chat. So it is there. Great. Well, Tom Emma Moore Campbell. at the, uh, the Okemos Library, uh, the head librarian in Okemos, Tom Moore, got in touch with me. It's been last fall. I guess they have plantings around the Okemos Library that are native plantings, and I took a look at them. They have an issue with the person who's tended those has retired, they need somebody to take it over and they yeah. just need some instructions. So I took a lot of pictures, but this has been really helpful to me. I don't have a landscaping background at all. And just hearing the strategies, uh, Carolyn has been really great. And I'm I'm with, I'm the president of the Meridian Garden Club. Okay. And I wanna get in touch with you to see if we can get you in to talk to our members. Oh, I would love to. I love to talk. <laughs> it's a passion. <laughs> Bruce? Yeah, Emma Campbell uh, and the Meridian uh, Conservation Corps. Oh, yes. She uh, periodically gets a group together to go down and, and do weeding and things in that uh, Park Lake uh, um, Bircham um, rain garden oh, oh. area. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, and, and we're all a bunch of uh, volunteers, basically. And um, we could, uh, we could, stand for a little bit of uh, expertise to take care of that. Oh, I would love to. Absolutely. I know Emma very well. We've done a lot of invasive species removal, um, especially over at Waldemar uh, Nature Center. That's kind of been our, um, that's been one of my focus points with, with everything. So 
I've done a lot of work with Emma. She's fantastic. And yeah, I would love to, you know, love to help out with that roundabout and maybe kind of do some redesigning of it and rethinking of what we should put in. That's really exciting. Um, I, I do want to mention that there is a green grant program um, this year that's the funding has doubled. And so we have the opportunity to do some projects. I understand you helped with the Cornell Woods pond restoration. Yes. Sarah, Sarah's often uh, comes to oh, these yes. dialogues. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you have other projects in Meridian that um, need a little bit extra help, um, definitely um, I can, I'll try and share the green grant okay. form. Uh, Barb has done a project with a local school and um, some of you, others of you may have been involved with some of those as well, but uh, um, Kim had a question. Absolutely. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to um, define uh, what you do for hire. Uh, is it designing landscapes, the actual planting? I do How it far all. do you go on all that? <laughs> it's just me. Um, okay. Sometimes I usually get um, being in a veal garden. Uh, I have a lot of you know I have a lot of students, and a lot of them want to learn. So I usually, um, I pick a few students up as well to help me out. Uh, their backs are younger than mine. <laughs> so that's the big thing. <laughs> but yeah, I do the consulting, the design, and then the installations. So, but then I always tell the homeowners that, you know, it's up to you guys to sort of, uh, you know, that first year to water, make sure things don't peter out and, and do the weeding. So, because until things get established, you know, weeds are going to come in. So that's, that's just what happens. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. What are some of the biggest challenges you've run into in helping, helping people get started? Is, I you think you probably hinted at that, but it is. watering it's the... the it's the maintenance afterwards. Um, and, you know, cause that's a big one is it's not a one and done. I have a client in, in the Lansing area and she had it, you know, front and back and in the, um, the health strip, so to say, <laughs> all done in native plants. You know, I wasn't the one that did it, but there were some bad plant choices. And so for a number of seasons, I was trying to rectify that and still trying to rectify it. Um, just things that should not have been planted where they were. Um, so that was a challenge. And, you know, it's still kind of ongoing. I do more of a consulting with her now. She's got a good crew that comes in because it was taking up so much of my time. And I really wanted to get more people into planting native pollinator gardens and little pocket prairies is what I kind of, you know, just those little pocket pollinator gardens. And so it was kind of taking my time away. <laughs> so, you know, it just depends on if it's a new installation, you know, you got to keep the maintenance up. And even once it's established, there's still maintenance. Um, it might be, you know, it might be deadheading something so that they don't spread. Uh, might be removing some of those rhizominous spreaders. And that was the you know, the, for this client in Lansing, that's what it was. So to try to pick a way at getting those out of the landscape. Thank you. Um, by the way, Emily Conway, who's done uh, urban prairie restoration mm -hmm. is gonna be with us in a couple weeks. Um, next, next week, Nick Dupuy uh, with the city of Birmingham as a principal planner is gonna talk about the leaf blower ordinance that they have been implemented. And um, in February, John Sarver is going to join us again to talk a little bit about the Solarize program. Do you have other talks that you'd like to give or topics you'd like to suggest for a green dialogue? Please let me know. Um, any remaining questions in our last few minutes here? Thank you so much, Carolyn. 
I understand you're giving another talk at noon. Yes, <laughs> same one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for squeezing us in. Do you have any other um, words of wisdom you'd like to share before we depart? You know, just like the, um, you know, if you plant it, they will come. Uh, it's really amazing. I, I'm just in awe at the species of bees that have come in and I'm trying to get better at identifying them so that I can kind of keep my own record of what is visiting um and you know and it's just exciting um i love watching those you know kind of those spring bloomers come up and then everything just flourishes and it's just you know it's a flutter of activity in my front yard so just and planters you know planters can work too zinnias are a fantastic bee and butterfly plant believe it or not so lots of our annuals can be used as pollinator plants in container gardens. So, you know, that's another, that's another aspect as well. Great. Love to hear more about your um, master's um, thesis as well and helping people to get started in uh, small Thank gardens. You. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> thanks everybody. Have a great week and hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> really enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you, you so much. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thank you. Yeah.